Okay, I'm very excited. So let's get going. Um, thank you, everyone, and welcome to the second Network Book Forum in our three part series, A Spotlighting Digital Black Feminism by Catherine Knight Steele. I'm Serena Duro, research analyst on the policy team at Data and Society. I will be your host alongside my colleagues, Nazali and Rigo, behind the curtain. A data and Society is an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and regularly convene multidisciplinary thinkers to challenge the power and purpose of technology and society. Data and Society began in New York City, an island node in a large network of hills, rivers, and mountains in the Atlantic Northeast known as Lenape Hoking, the ancestral lands of the Lenny Lenape people. Today, we are connected via online via a different network, a vast array of servers, humans, and computer devices. In the United States, much of the system sits on stolen land acquired under the extractive logic of white settler expansion. As an organization, we recognize this history and uplift the sovereignty of indigenous people, data, and territory around the world. We commit to dismantling all ongoing settler colonial practices and their material implications on our digital worlds. So today I'm very excited for this chat. Um, it's gonna be about digital black feminism, a new book by assistant professor of communication at the University of Maryland, Dr. Catherine Knight Steele, which traces the longstanding relationship between technology and black feminist thought. Um, throughout this forum, feel free to tweet your thoughts and, um, you know, online. You can tag you know, Data and Society, Dr. Catherine Knight Steele, myself, and you can also type in questions on Zoom in the Q&A box. So, would love your engagement if you'd give it to us. Um, now I'm very excited to hand it over to Catherine for a bit of author remarks to really set the scene for this conversation. And then me and her will have a great conversation. And then in the end, we'll do our Q&A. But please put your questions you know, throughout, upvote different ones, et cetera, to prepare us for the Q&A where we really get to engage with y'all as the audience. Um, so Catherine, I'm excited to hand it over to you. Thank you so much. It's really great to be here with you, to be in conversation with you with Data and Society. Uh, I'm really looking forward to our conversation, so I will try to keep my remarks as short as possible. Um, I thought, though, I'd just begin by talking a little bit about how this book, Digital Black Feminism, came to be. Um, I started writing this book really about seven years ago when I was working on my dissertation. And my dissertation research was on the Black blogosphere. I was looking at how the blogosphere could function as a space of political importance that was often being overlooked in the research, that the discourse in this space was not as simple as simply naming it as a counterpublic, because oftentimes the work that was happening there was intentionally and rather brilliantly hidden from the dominant group through the kinds of high context conversations that were happening and the way that Black bloggers were maximizing the affordances of that platform. But the truth is that even though the concept for digital black feminism emerged during that data collection, I really set it to the side to just complete the requirements of my PhD. And while I regretted at the time that I couldn't give that portion of my research as much attention as I wanted to do, uh, in retrospect, the additional years provided me a couple of things. Uh, one was a different methodological tool chest. Uh, a different focus on the importance of the history and the archive, but also I think what those years in between did was put on public display just how consequential Black feminist thought and Black women are to the future of digital technology. I think we probably all remember when phrases like listen to Black women and ask Black women became popularized after the election of the 45th president. Though we were exposed to the same rhetoric at that time and living under very similar economic conditions, Black women made a very different choice for president than their white female counterparts in that election. So those phrases got adopted by activists and allies and journalists who were trying to point to Black women's voting records in both presidential and local elections. Uh, Twitter users were creating memes to remind the public that Black women are trying to save America from itself. But those popular hashtags, and those phrases that loud Black women for their decision making don't do the work of actually explaining the centuries of wisdom and labor and ingenuity that have put Black women in the position to have to be this long suffering group that has is very rarely thanked 
for the attempt to save America from itself. And I think that's the case with a lot of our hashtagable lines. These phrases like listen to black women often do very little more than virtue signal without a requirement to actually follow through in terms of understanding and utilizing black feminist praxis and principles. So I think it's true that black women are consistently doing the radical work of calling for the US to make right on a promise of democracy. Because if we look back to 2016, we see that Black women were exposed to the same trolls, the same bots, the same fake news stories on social media. In fact, very often were the target of those kinds of campaigns of disinformation. And what I wondered in that period of time from my dissertation to when I actually in earnest started writing this book was, what if the liberal politicians, the progressive writers actually asked Black women how they made political calculations amid this barrage of fake news and disinformation? What if we inquired about Black women's relationship with social media and technology? Because that relationship didn't shield us from exposure, but it did provide a skill set to navigate trolling, to navigate hate speech online. What if as a collective, we tried to learn about the long history of Black women's use of technology and the long developed school skills that are in both intercultural communication, but also intracultural within community communication that make Black women purveyors of social media, making good decisions both for ourselves and our communities. So the goals of my book ended up being twofold. The first was that we started to rightly position Black women online as central to the future of communication technology, that we trace the long historical relationship between Black women and technology and reposition Black women online as holding a skill set and an expertise, not deficient, not in need of new skills to survive a changing digital landscape. Because what we know to be true, what we've seen to be true, is that Black women without extensive programming experience have already maximized platform affordances, built transmedia platforms, led platform migrations, they pushed policy uh, regarding hate speech and content moderation and introduced even new pay structures that were the precursors to what we call influencer culture now. I see examples of this with bloggers like Lovia J, with writers and editors like Jamila Lemieux, uh, like Kimberly Nicole Foster moving for Harriet into a now a YouTube platform. Uh, Mara Lindy, who was one of the co-founders of the app Shine, said, imagine if all the ideas we're missing out on are because people from more marginalized experiences that are uniquely positioned to solve problems because of those experiences struggle to see themselves in our existing platforms and founders. But I don't think this is a problem for Black women to solve or other marginalized groups to solve. Black women make structural alterations to digital spheres of communication, already developing standalone apps and platforms. We're already early adopters. We're already transformers of existing platforms. And our online content has served as a model for other creatives. So instead, what digital Black feminism, this text does, is provide us the historical context necessary to consider this digital turn and chart Black women's long-standing relationship to better understand the future, potentially, of our digital world. Now, the second goal of the text is to document the shift in Black feminist principles and praxis because of Black women's relationship and encounter with technology, positioning Black thinkers online and their writing as central to the, our ongoing work in liberation. Um, writer Feminista Jones said, who could have predicted that people who never set foot on a college campus, much less in specialized journalism schools, would have international audiences reading their cultural and sociopolitical analyses or have their work as a part of a rigorous academic curriculum at universities that they could never afford to attend? She's right, but also Black feminist thinkers have always existed outside the academy. There's something strange happening though, where this generation's use of digital tools and social media platforms has led many people to disregard their work as simply being a part of some neoliberal superstructure, devaluing what they create online. So just because we're doing lifestyle blogging and natural hair tutorials, because our online snark and memes are perfectly placed, that doesn't mean that our work is superficial or untethered to serious scholarship. None of these practices exclude Black feminists online from liberation work. Instead, what we're doing is locating our spaces of retreat right alongside our activist work, earning our living using the tools of this digital capitalist superstructure while still pushing forward a liberation ideology. So the truth is that Black girls who may not code 
already have the knowledge and ability to navigate digital platforms. Our relationship with digital tools and culture is changing how we view technology today. So in this book, I analyze the content of digital Black feminist thought online and our mechanisms for production and dissemination, dealing with these very messy complexities that emerge as a form of digital Black feminism is imbued with digital praxis. I was first introduced to computing at around 10 years old when Mavis Beacon taught me how to type. Every day after school, my lessons began on my family's shared computers when I placed my fingers on the keys and started where I left off the day before, checking to see if my words per minute and percentage of words uh, properly typed had increased from the day before. On the cover of that CD-ROM case was Mavis Beacon in a yellow suit with white pearls and her hair was slicked back in a neat bun. This black woman was my typing teacher and she was the expert typing teacher for many other little black girls in the 1980s and 1990s. For black feminists of a certain age, she was one of the first public images of black computing in our youth. So a whole generation of black feminists start their relationship with digital technology from an image that's crafted by a company to sell software. Mavis Beacon wasn't real. Her manufactured image, though, is instructive of how digital Black feminists form their relationship to technology. Typing, which is a productive skill for a new economy, was pitched to the public by an image of a Black woman who lives only in the imagination of software developers, not by the real Black women whose technical skills have always served the economic needs of others. So Mavis was training us to type, but in a world of home computers, typing wasn't the work of an assistant in an office. Typing was a required skill for professionals and creative content creators and writers. There exists agency in typing an essay with your own thoughts to being able to share those thoughts online. It was a gift that was provided at least in part by Mavis Beacon. But before black feminists started writing in the blogosphere, penning Twitter threads, developing long form essays, black feminist orators made that transition to writing their thoughts in the form of essays and news articles and folk stories and memoirs. I was really privileged in this text to be able to tell those stories and showcase the continuity over time between Black feminist praxis of the past and the present, and then to document the changing principles of Black feminism as we navigate this world now where Black feminist thought has become a digital product. product. So I'm really excited to continue this conversation with you today and talk more about digital Black feminism. Yes, thank you so much for that. I'm so excited. Uh, I have to say, like, for me, I mean, even just seeing the title Digital Black Feminism, I was so excited because I was like, I just know this book's going to go in. I know it's going to be extremely <laughs> interesting. And it was like, did not let me down at all. Um, something that meant a lot for me. Um, so like some of my work, you know, for people who may not know, like I'm a policy research analyst. Um, a lot of work around like uh, algorithmic bias and like helping communities of color and like focusing on those work and from kind of the get go of my introduction to the field I was like this needs like black women's thinking, but I feel like black women are so often and I think what that's what's lovely about your book is you really locate like where Black women intellectually produce and also how we're systematically left out of those systems, out of the areas where people would normally locate where intelligence is or things are created. And yeah. you just go to where, you know, where we are, which is it's a lot of places. Like, you know, we do stuff in the academy and otherwise. But um, I think for me, it was a great call to be like, yes. And kind of almost an affirmation of like, those thoughts are true that we do need black feminism in these spaces. Um, like I wrote a couple pieces about, uh, you know, needing an analysis and policy on like black mm -hmm. women's needs and desires, et cetera. But it kind of felt like an empty void. Like, does anyone really want to listen to this? But I think your book and so many other work by black women just shows that we are pushing for that, which is very beautiful. Um, and so with that, um, I wanted to ask the first, like, and you kind of talk about this with your dissertation, but I'd love to hear more, like when you knew it was necessary to reach into the past to, to show the genius of and within Black women's technological practice, um, especially with the myth spread throughout internet studies that Black people slash women were late adapters and also the issue of archival amnesty that like purposely ignores yeah. and keeps out our contributions. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. I. Um... The last time someone asked, like, so how did you decide to go all the way back to the antebellum South and to, you know, to slavery to start thinking about Black women and technology? 
and, and it wasn't the initial goal of the book. When I started writing, I was writing, most of my work was very presentist, right? I was thinking about what was going on right now, what was happening in this digital landscape. And in writing the book, um, it was a, a shift back very gradually at first. So it started with, of course, I have to talk about the blogosphere as one of these really early digital touch points where Black women had the space and the agency and the ability to create these enclave spaces. But if I was going to talk about that, I'd have to look back a little bit further to think about hip hop feminism and talk about what Black women were doing in the 1990s and how we were carving out these spaces and these writing communities. And I thought, well, if I'm going to go that far back, then I have to think back to, and the problem is there's no start point to black women's genius. So there's no way to say, I'm just gonna start this in 1974 and go forward. If I actually wanna think through how black women have mastered technology when it was intentionally deprived from us, when it was intentionally removed from us, then I have to just keep going and keep going. And also what you end up seeing is the continuity that happens over time between um, the praxis between the relationship that Black women end up therefore having with these tools, and the tools may shift, right? So the tools I'm looking at in the 1840s are very different than the tools that I'm looking at in 2020. But the kinds of relationships that we form with these technologies, the kind of tenuous relationships that we have where we recognize their utility, where we're you know, practically utilizing them day to day whilst understanding the same ways that they replicate um, power differentials and cause harm in our lives, that's what remains consistent over time. And so if I wanted to tell the story of people touching computing and touching phones and playing on social media, then I really had to think about the origin points of when we started to encounter these kinds of tools and technologies that were created and developed as tools of oppress oppressive forces that were oftentimes developed um, intentionally in ways to keep divides in place, in ways to keep differentials in place, um, but were constantly utilized and reformed and reimagined by Black women to do other kinds of work. And so I was really happy to do that long history and to make the case, which I think is one that uh, is for all of us that are intentional about our work in studying digital technology and studying the internet, is that you cannot start from right now. You are doing a disservice to both the people that you're writing about and for and to the, the tools themselves to imagine that they just emerge out of nowhere. We're not really tracing the history of how these tools and technologies develop and why they develop, right, and what it comes to mean. So if we're going to think about technology. I really argue that we have to have a much more expansive view as what counts as a technology, what counts as a tool, because that also allows us to think about who gets left out of technological expertise and why. So why do tools begin to carry these meanings that leave Black women out, even though we're mastering things that would have previously been considered a technology? So, you know, it was in some ways accidental, um, in other ways, incredibly intentional to say that we can't start here and now we're going to have to look at the long history here. Yes, and I love, I love how that kind of pan, panned out, <laughs> like, okay, I have, to go, I have to go back, have to go back. And also what I love about it is kind of like what you're saying is you're giving a new and I mean, it's not new, that's kind of hard word to use, but a central way to look at technological development that also right. really challenges current norms. So it seems to me like within the book, what, you know, when you mention, not that it's always bad, but the problem sometimes with groups like Black Girls Code is it seems like there's this arc of technological development. And it's like, and hey, now let's add Black women. Like, this is the first time they're getting involved. They're learning how to code. And you say, no, there's a completely new, different there's a completely yeah. different way that you've chosen not to look at technology. Right. right. Yeah, I think it's about re-centralizing different, different pieces. I'm glad you brought that up. You know, Black Girls Code does, does great work in terms of, of providing opportunities. Um, but what I tried to do in the text, as you're as you pointing out, was start from a different center point. Mm -hmm. If our center point isn't whiteness, isn't white maleness, when we study technoculture, right? Which I think Andre Brock gives us a, a great entry point to thinking about centralizing uh, Black technoculture. Mm -hmm. But I, if we don't start from the point of deficiency, if we don't start from the point that whiteness is central and therefore black, Blackness and Black womanness is deviant, is deficient, mm -hmm. what if Black womanness was the center point? What if we rearticulate our framework for technology to make space for that? Not that we add on Black women too, 
We're studying the algorithms and what about black women too? We're studying tech policy and what about black women too? But what if black women were at the center of this? Then it would give us a very different lens because if you study technology from the standpoint of folks who simultaneously have had technology used to cause them harm, um, but also have therefore been the ones to find the most ingenious and, 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 um, and, and, and creative mechanisms to utilize that technology, then you're going to see both the expansive possibilities of tech, but also the, the constraints. You're going to see where it falls short. You're going to see where it does harm. You're going to see where the design features are not set up. To, to include, not only to include, but are set up and designed in order to keep those structural uh, different points in place. So I really try to, in the text, not do the comparative thing, not do the like, white women are this way and so black women are this way and black men did this and so black women did that. Like, what if we just thought about black women as being important enough to study all on our own? Um, and from that different lens, from that different framework, I think a lot of new questions and possibilities, new methods, uh, new focus on ethics, uh, all emerge from that different center point. For sure. And what's always intrigued me and what I've loved about, I mean, being a Black woman, studying Black feminism, et cetera, is I think due to being at the intersection of so many different axes of oppression, it's like my freedom really ne necessitates other people's freedom. Like That's right. Um, you know, and so it's good, you know, even within technology for multiple reasons to like look at black women's experiences and like knowledge standpoint, which I don't want to get ahead of myself on ask about <laughs> that later. Um, but something that I was also thinking of when you're speaking is, you know, you're talking about how black women's labor is devalued. And you talk about that in the antebellum South with even how black women's labor is kind of portrayed in slavery, like maybe they're in the house or not working as hard and you just nix that. You're like, that's not true. Um, to today even where, despite the power of the influencer economy or the importance of the blogosphere, et cetera, people kind of devalue that as like, that's mm. not real work. And I think what's cool in your book is you use the beauty shop as kind of this like central point that like shows an important place of like um, economic power, of technological development, of also political choices that right. like runs through Black women's experiences from the antebellum South to now. So I was mm -hmm. wondering if you could just speak more to like why you think or like kind of when the beauty shop to you became a clear important example of like digital black feminist praxis and also just like an important space for black women in general. So I'll, I'll be honest, I really thought I was doing something when I came up with the barbershop metaphor to talk about the blogosphere back in, in the early 2010s. And I was thinking, oh, the barbershop, that's really clever, you know, because people are familiar with the barbershop and they understand its importance kind of in the black community as a space to gather and political decision-making and, you know, uh, an enclave space. Um, people have written books about it. We get Hush Harbor, we get movies about the barbershop. But, in, but I didn't write about the beauty shop then. And, and it, was, it was an oversight of sorts because really what the beauty shop does is all the same things of the barber shop, right? It's this it's central gathering place, it's all these things, but it really does something more and something that's, that's interesting to me as well. Because barber shops, black barber shop culture really begins when black barbers are servicing white men. Right, post slavery, you have black barbers as the primary folks who are cutting white men's hair. And then you have this concerted campaign that happens on the part of white, uh, white barbers and unions to uh, discredit black barber shops. They were doing too well, they were making too much money. And so uh, this, this concerted campaign happens to suggest that black barbers are not hygienic, don't have good tools, and it works, right? White men largely stop going to black barber shops. But there was not a, a similar parallel for Black women's beauty shops. Black women were servicing white women during enslavement, but post-enslavement, Black women were creating beauty products and beauty shops for other Black women. So the central point, the beginning, the origin story of uh, Black beauty shops is fascinating because it begins as a place where Black women are doing things for themselves. They are entrepreneurs who are creating spaces of necessity for other Black women. So they are simultaneously supporting a need of a community while um, financially supporting themselves and their families. But they're, as you said, they're also mastering these technologies like hair straightening, right? Which I talk about in the book briefly, but they're mastering them as a mechanism of survival. 
Black women, you have to go into these workplaces, you have to do these things, and this is what's necessary to be able to do that, right? And so we can have, and we should, and we do have larger conversations about the colorism that's bound up in a lot of hair care practices. But I think when we focus exclusively on that conversation and don't centralize the intelligence and the creativity that's required to engage in these hair, these hair technologies, right? Then we're also not centralizing black women again, we're centralizing whiteness because we're talking about how black women are working to become more white, to assimilate, to look more white. And, and I don't know about you, but the black women that I know who are masters at uh, straightening hair at that, you know, at weave, at like inst installations, at, at lace fronts, they're not trying to look like white women. That's not what's happening, right? There is a mastery of a technique that is celebrated for its possibilities among a large array of different other possibilities for hair care. And so I'm not suggesting that colorism doesn't, doesn't exist, quite to the contrary. It's, it's a huge part of the origin story of a lot of hair care technologies. But the point is, if we centralize instead the agency, if we centralize the, the proximal distance, uh, if we decentralize the proximal distance to whiteness and instead focus on how these technologies showcase expertise in a really particular way, then we tell a different story about the beauty shop. We tell a story where Black women are at the center and we can understand the why and the how of what they create for themselves, of how they master these spaces to do really important work within a community and also to support themselves. So that's why the beauty shop becomes really important. It's a, it's a space about entrepreneurship. It's a space about technology, about community, but also financial support for the self. And it tells a really valuable story about what Black women were doing online and how that blogosphere has really pushed into different spaces now that we're perhaps more familiar with in Instagram culture and TikTok culture. And we see that transformative thing that Black women were able to do from that space. Thank you so much for that. That just has me thinking of all the, so many things, but I'm gonna keep it to my questions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this actually connects with and the next question I have because you know, something that you highlighted even earlier, actually, you wrote how the blogosphere is not just a counter public. Like a lot of times you're engaging in a call and response, which is also like, you know, a very like black thing to do, <laughs> like to, you know, want to engage personally. And also like the privacy that's kind of needed for black people to commune together. I mean, especially I think with kind of like the hyper visibility and invisibility that, you know, like blackness kind of engages with due to like state surveillance. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to ask like how you think the beauty shop provides a model for like building social media platforms that allows black women to gather without prying eyes or in a way, also, slash also in a way that economically benefits them. Because, yeah. you know, with other platforms, it seems like Actually, you, you use the example with Very Smart Brothers, I believe, where mm -hmm. you talked about how they had like a very thriving like call and response system. Mm -hmm. But then when they chose to go to that counter public to mm -hmm. make more money, it's like you got the money, but now you don't have the privacy and the ability to engage in as deep in a way. Um, so I was just wondering, like, is there a way that the beauty shop provides um, an example that can maybe be used so that we can make money and engage, but not you know, I'm having to have kind of the harms of social media that currently exist. Yeah, I mean, this is why the blogosphere, I think, was a really special moment uh, in, in our digital history that doesn't get enough written about it. We, we have a tendency, I think, as digital scholars to move very quickly on to the next thing, you know, so what's what's happening right now, we have to hurry up and get something written about that because everything's going to change. And so this it's why I really kind of insist on looking backward and insist on looking back to these spaces. I think what I liked about writing about the blogosphere um, and, and that period in time was it gave a, a chance to really parse out this public private thing that we still focus on uh, kind of inexplicably, even though we all live in this world where we know that those terms no longer serve us in the way that, that they used to, right? This idea that there are some spaces that are public and there are some spaces that are private just doesn't work as mm -hmm. well in our digital landscape. But the thing is that black folks have always experienced this thing where public and private were not the same as they were for white folks, right? So uh, Zora Neale Hurston writes about this in the absence of the concept of privacy in, in her essay, The Characteristics of Negro Expression in 1934, right? She's writing about how in these United States, black folks have always been under surveillance, have always had an, a watchful eye on us. 
And so the ability to exist within that notion that someone is watching, but without a care is really beautiful actually, right? Like the ability to say that I know people are gonna see this, but I'm not performing for them. This is still about this communal experience and the way that we keep folks out without actual physical boundary lines, right? So the black church functions as this beautiful enclave for generations, right? Where not, not, not wholly unproblematic, but yet a beautiful discursive enclave where what keeps folks out is the lack of context necessary to participate. There's not a formal boundary structure, right? The doors of the church are open, yet people coming in are going to relate only in so much as they have this deep contextual relationship with Black spirituality, right? With Black history, with Black um, political movement, right? That those elements are necessary to adequately participate. And that's what we see carry into the blogosphere. So when you mention a site like Very Smart Brothers, which I love, right? I love to talk about that site. Um, that's exactly what they were able to master was the high context necessary for participation whilst having an open door while they were hosting their own site, right? Anyone could come and go. But what you notice is that the people who stayed, the commenters, the people who are engaging are people who are there every day, were folks who knew each other and knew the jokes and got the jokes intuitively, who had the same popular cultural references, had the same experiences when they were at work. And so there was no gatekeeping in so much as you can't read this, you can't participate here. But what the blogs allowed folks to do was to create the high content context necessary that would de de delegate that as an enclave space. There was no goal of reaching some larger, wider audience in those, in those years. And you mentioned that transition that VSBs made over to the root, right? And to a larger platform, which really opened up the doors even further because then you have distribution happening on this blog that now folks outside of that tight-knit community are able to see and witness those pieces. And there's really great things that come with that. Like we have to be very clear that having that broader audience for black writers is really important often, not only for their livelihood, but also for really important content that they're writing. You know, Damon Young wrote a really fantastic piece uh, about uh, patriarchy and black men that got a lot of media attention. Panama Jackson, the other writer, primary writer on that site wrote a really smart and thoughtful piece about his mother and Donald Trump, right? And that got a lot of uh, widespread attention and, and created lots of important conversations about that. Um, but as you also point out, when you open those doors of possibility, when the context drops, and that's really what's important, right? So it matters less that they're a part of this other platform and more that to be a part of this platform, your context level is lower so that there's a wider net of participation that's possible. And when we think about that transition from the blogosphere to social media, we see the same thing happening, right? Where especially in spaces where algorithms are determining who's following us, versus people opting in, right? So when we have TikTok, that TikTok that's almost entirely based on an external algorithm determining what I'm going to be interested in, then my net has to be cast a little wider, right? If I want more people to be drawn into my content, um, if the goal is to have more people drawn into the content. And so that's something that we have to consider is what are the goals of Black creatives online right now? Are the goals to have the widest net possible to bring the most people in in some cases, yes, some um, content creators are absolutely looking to have these expansive audiences because it's financially beneficial, right? There's endorsement deals and there is advertising that's paid in all those other areas. But there are also content creators who are not looking to have their content thrive in these other spaces, that they're very intentionally crafting content for black communities and still using that high context necessary for participation. So what I think Catherine Squires gives us, which I, I use throughout the book, is this terminology to kind of think through. Well, there are some times where Black uh, creators want to engage with the public. They're, they're trying to provoke that kind of debate. But there are other times where we're not. And of course, that's the case because we're complex and we're not homogenous. And so if we keep writing about everything that Black folks do online as being about a resistant counter public, then we're really limiting um, our understanding of all the potentialities of Blackness, of Black thought, and of Black discursive power online. Thank you for that. That really, I really love how you put the, the amount of context needed and what happens when there's like higher or lower. Because I, you know, I think of TikTok of, I saw someone talking the other day of their like, it seems like Black mannerisms, like AAVE, like all of these things. 
especially on TikTok, are so easily taken and adapted where right, right. a lot of like black like things traits ways of speaking etc are being adopted as if it's just general and yeah. you know that appropriation has always happened but it's almost on a more rampant scale specifically due to TikTok, even compared to other mm-hmm. social media platforms it seems to me and yeah. i think what you said about the context levels needed like TikTok, it's so low you can almost participate and know what's going on just from observing a few things and they could take it I mean whether you really know what's going on is debatable like a lot of right. times people use it but right. the ability to tap in is very easy the tap in ability is very easy I think the ability to misread and misunderstand and misappropriate is just as easy as you just pointed out right I remember when I was working on the dissertation the the, um, the phrase by Felicia was like very becoming like a thing and very smart brothers was writing about like the death of this term because uh, white folks had like adopted it and I always know that like a phrase is completely dead if I like see a CNN anchor use it right so like as soon as something like that happens you know the phrase is over but what was interesting with by Felicia and I think what's interesting now with a lot of what's happening with black content creators on TikTok with the sound usage I think we can make that parallel is that people adopt it and they begin to use it but they're not using it right. They really are not using it appropriately, right? Like they're missing the joke just just enough that the folks who were in on the initial joke recognize how off it is and then we're done with that sound. We're done with that moment. So by Felicia, for example, gets used totally wrong. People are just angry at somebody like, bye Felicia. It's like, did you see Friday? Do you understand that Felicia was still welcome? Like Felicia, we didn't hate Felicia. Like Felicia, it was dismissive of Felicia in the moment, but Felicia's gonna be back tomorrow, right? And so, but this was missed on people. The same way that like we have sounds now on TikTok that emerge and folks are using it in a small kind of black TikTok corner. And then the sound migrates out into kind of a more mainstream space and it's not being picked up quite in the right way. And so then you you have this moment where black content creators are done with the sound now because you've ruined it, right? <laughs> the sound has been the sound's been ruined. It's no longer funny. And so I say all of that to say, it's sick. This is not new again. Um, the the theft of black culture, the misuse of black culture is persistent. It is relentless. And what is also persistent and relentless is black creativity. Um, and the ability to transform and to reinvent and to create new context that's necessary for participation. I think you rightly point out that TikTok's expanse and the ability of immediate access to Black space is something that we're all paying closer attention to and how quickly um, you can tap into these spaces without needing to know someone or being invited somewhere that you can just kind of invite yourself into these spaces is something that folks are paying attention to. Uh, the creatives are paying attention to as well in terms of how they release content and how they require and, and are making claims on content and citation and, and people actually giving credit for their, their content and their creativity. For sure. And I love that you bring that up because I think something that I've seen more so is that kind of citational practice. Yeah. Like I've seen more and more Black, like Black women online being like, this is important. It's a Black feminist principle. And it's almost even more important as we resist the ways that social media and algorithms can be used to not only, like you say, kind of like take Black trends, but often the people making money off of it aren't Black people. So it's like, it's, it's, a, it's a financial issue. It's a racial issue. As it it's is. And, it, men. and I think it's a complicated one, right? Like, I think that there's, there's absolutely what you point out, this citational practice that's really important of us giving credit to folks who have created uh, content. There's also, though, the commodification of thought and of uh, of what used to be freely shared ideas and conversation that we also, I think, have to keep an eye on, right? So while it is, it does my heart so well to see Black creatives get credit for their content and to get credit, and, and particularly for Black feminist writers and thinkers, to get credit for the invaluable work that they do online that's often not cited and are starting to be cited more often. There's also this moment of realization of what happens when we turn things that are supposed to be radical liberatory ideologies into commodities. Mm. So when I begin to sell black feminist thought, what does that do to black feminist thought? What does that do to radical praxis of freedom? for it to have a numerative scale to it, right? 
Mm -hmm. um, and so it's something that we have to really, and, and what I try to do in the book is not in any way glorify digital black feminism or be completely critical of it, but to just say, here's what's going on. And we need to be mindful of the fact that while we've entered this space where everything is become commodified, right? That mm -hmm. that includes black feminists creating themselves as brands and products. And that there is a limit to how far we can go down a path of charging for liberation ideology, right? <laughs> for charging for radical free thought. That if it becomes a good that is for sale, then we no longer control that, right? Like the marketplace does. And that can be a really scary path to go down. For sure. And I love that you bring that up because I mean, it's also this tension that you kind of mentioned in your book of like one of the kind of like five principles of like black feminist practice of, or digital black feminist practice of like uh, care for the community, but also yourself. And part yeah. of that is like, I need to get paid, <laughs> you know, like all these, all these different tensions, but it's like, but how much, how much is too far? Yeah. And you even mentioned there was an example, maybe you can speak more to of, it was like an ad for an event that people thought was kind of inappropriate yeah, because yeah. they were worried about the commodification and you were like, maybe it isn't, but people, people are looking at it and are wondering and, you know, like, are you trying to commodify it or not? And sometimes they are, and sometimes they aren't. Yeah. And that's a very difficult boundary that like black feminist thinkers, activists, et cetera, have to toe. Yeah. I mean, we're seeing countless examples of that day to day and just stories that have come out in the last few days about this tension between activism and getting paid, right? <laughs> and, and turning one's activism into a job or into a marketable thing that one gets paid for. And, and I walk through this in several places in the book with, with Black feminist thinkers writing, like, listen, I have, I have bills, I have a home, I have a family, I have things that I have to pay for, and I have thoughts that are valuable. And there is a real um, you know, necessity to Black women marking our thoughts and our work and our labor as valuable, skilled work, right? That we are living within a capitalist system presently. Whether or not we're fighting to deconstruct it, presently, this is our location, this is our proximal location. Mm -hmm. And therefore, in this system, we are to be paid for our labor, right? And that's one piece. But then the second piece that you point out is the extent to which, and I think this is a really good thing, um, the average person, average, you know, like black person is paying attention to the extent that activism is being turned into a commodity and is being very protective over the idea that there are folks who are, are there to buy and sell on black trauma and black pain and mm -hmm. that we should be paying more attention to when and if that is happening. And so even in instances where we have folks that have the best of intentions are bent toward marketing and branding and strategizing in digital spaces makes it appear as though our events that may be raising money for someone's family or maybe set out to do some work of, of, you know, broadening a cause look a whole lot like a concert plug, right? <laughs> They're mirroring in a lot of ways, the same kind of marketing that's happening in these other arenas that are, are, are focused on commodity that are focused on money making. And so what does it mean? We really do have to keep asking ourselves, what does it mean when our, our what's supposed to be a radical thought like that? This will, like black feminism exists to break systems yes. of capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. We cannot divorce patriarchy and white supremacy from systems of imperialism and capitalism. Mm -hmm. So if this exists to do this work, what does it mean when we have to flirt along those lines with this capitalist superstructure that is our, our digital economy. What does it mean to have to do that? And, and what are the extents of where that works and where that's functional and where it does us a disservice? And I think we're, we're in a right place to begin to, to chart that in our own work, to be mindful of what, how our work participates in that, but also to be critical of spaces where we see folks crossing those boundary lines. For sure. No, and I love that point because I mean, I also think, you know, in the very beginning, actually, and, and this was a quote that I really loved as well. You talked about women, Black women's decision making, even within politics, um, mm -hmm. like the 2016 election versus 2020. And I think what you really show is just like the importance also of Black feminism to when we look at tech policy or just like anything like, you know, uh, 
analyzing digital culture, et cetera, is because it's so complicated. Like right. I, I'm thinking about liberating myself from capital structures, but also I have to feed myself. Also black women are normally caring for other people. Like mm -hmm. there's so mm -hmm. many things involved, my own livelihood, my community's livelihood, and also the world's that it's like, it's complex thinking, which is why it's important for people to engage with. I mean, it's not always perfect, but it kind of can't be because, you know, the reason we have to think this way is because of the systems of oppression. That's that right. This position. That's right. I'm Sarah Florini. I think I've heard her say this in several talks that she's given uh, where she talks about if it were simple to, to break down racism, then racism wouldn't even be a great tool. I mean, like it's a, you know, like it's such, it, it is such a powerful tool because mm -hmm. it is so difficult to disentangle ourselves yes, from this system. If it were simple to do that, it wouldn't have had such a long lasting impact on human society, right? The reason that patriarchy and racism and colonialism are, are still here is because they work really well and because we become really deeply invested in them and it becomes increasingly difficult to disentangle ourselves from these interrelated ideas. But we do have roadmaps for this, we, you know, and this is why I keep pointing to history. We do have folks who have shown us the possibilities, the, the, the gaps in the matrices, right? So the matrix of oppression um, that, that Pat Hill Collins talks about, there are, are places where the thread is thinner that because people have worked on it. There are places where there are gaps and holes that we can push through if we were to actually look to them if we were to actually find those folks who did that work as valuable members of this digital culture that we're trying to understand, right? If we didn't start from the place that these are the experts, these are the technological experts, and these are the folks that we're trying to help out, right? What if these folks actually had the expertise and we actually look to them to understand how to uh, make this system better for everyone? Because as you put it, when black women are free, everybody else has to be as a matter of necessity. So if we look to the folks who are trying to free themselves, but also trying to break down the system in order to do so, because that's, I think, the unique piece about Black feminist thought. Black feminists are not about raising Black women to the power structure level of white men, right? Mm -hmm. That's not the aim. The aim is that the whole system has to come apart in order for us to be free. So we're not looking to a place of trying to replace the folks in power with ourselves, but tear down a system that is by necessity is putting folks in these differentiated positions of power. For sure. No, and I, yeah, I just love talking about that. And I'm going to put one more question and I'm going to give it to Q&A. Um, and just due to the work, you know, that data and society that we do, um, I just thought it'd be important to talk about. You have a one quote, which I love at the end of your book, that's for those studying online harassment and trolling, algorithmic bias and digital activism, black women must be included in your work. Um, obviously, I really believe in that. And I think we've kind of touched upon some points of, it's obvious through this discussion of black women's standpoint, which we've talked about our relationship to technology that's important. I was wondering if you could just break it down a bit more because I just think that point can't be talked about enough. Well, I think that Black women as whole agentic human beings have to be a part of our work. And I think that for, for so many people who are thinking about um, uh, oppressive forces and digital technology, that the inclusion of Black women is periphery. It's, it, it is still from a place of marginalization. It's still from a place in a lot of ways of not seeing the full humanness of the people that were working alongside. And so part of what I tried to, to do in this book was not just through the content, but through the method, through my approach to centralize the people that I was talking about rather than just the content that they leave behind as a data point, right? That like we are talking about human beings' lives and the artifacts of their lives that they've left here for us to see and for us to witness, that we are more than the data points that us reporting on and writing about people impacts them in really particular ways and that they do have some say so and they should have some control over what that looks like. And so we can't operate from a place of, of a savior mentality that we're here to fix things for this broken group or that we know better or that we have the capacities to do things that they can't do for themselves. That is, I think, a, a, a falter point, a faulting point for a lot of well-meaning uh, organizations, right? That if we if we do this, then it'll make life better for this group of people who couldn't possibly imagine how to do it for themselves. History tells us it's not true. 
And so if we actually point to the ways that folks have been involved in their own liberatory practices, if we look to the corners and the crevices of digital landscapes um, that we haven't looked at before, that we have, have been excluded by necessity based on the kind of methods and strategies that we've used to gather data. So when we're scraping the web and we're gathering up these huge big data analyses of sites, what's not being picked up? What context are we missing? What histories are we missing? What linguistic practices are we missing um, you know, to serve the end of having a larger data set or to serve the end of getting the most expansive sample? Uh, so there are ways that we have to really question our own strategies, our own methods, our own engagement with communities in our practice of doing uh, data analyses, of doing policy work as it relates to digital culture. And I try to model some of that in this text. Um, there's a place, obviously, for big data, but that place has to be alongside and it has to be utilized by people who recognize the humanity of the people on the other side of that data. Absolutely. And that's something I've noticed within and kind of like struggles with my own like work, where, you know, working on AI accountability policy. And I did advocacy at my former job around algorithmic equity as well. And something I noticed is that of the list of stakeholders who are consulted, you know, policymakers, data scientists, academics, et cetera, like engaging with black folks was kind of like, maybe we'll talk to some people who've been harmed and like, that's it. And I'm like, well, yes, you should. <laughs> like you should engage, engage with communities, like especially like black folks in areas that are heavily surveilled, et cetera. Like that is, that is an absolute. In addition, Blackness as like a knowledge, as a knowledge point and as like a standpoint should be seen as important as well, like not just something to consult on the side. So, but it's kind of hard to, you know, and for me engaging with these things, it's like, how do I bring that there when people are so used to Blackness being seen at the periphery that it seems pretty radical to be like, let's use Black theory, Black feminism, et cetera, mm -hmm. as a root point, not mm -hmm. just, you know, on the outside. Um, I feel very privileged to have been able to do that because I take your point. I don't think that it's a given that we as academics, as researchers, always feel the freedom to be able to centralize Blackness in our work. Um, I think that it's a, it's a political move to be able to do it. And it's a decision, I think, for a lot of folks that their work's not going to be taken seriously. And mm -hmm. I think that that's what many of us enter into this with is the possibility that this work will be relegated to the black spaces of these conversations, right? Which I'm very happy to be in the black spaces of everything, but also that this work that works like, um, like Distributed Blackness by Andre Brock or um, um, Beyond Hashtags by Sarah Florini or, or, or uh, Sophia Noble's Algorithms of Oppression, right? That these are central works about digital technology, period, mm -hmm. right? That they focus on race or they focus on black culture. But at their core, they are telling a story about digital culture, about our future, that is for everyone to understand. And it is incumbent upon the reader to make themselves, uh, make it possible for you to understand this because we're gonna write it from a black lens. We're gonna write it using black theory. And so if you don't have it, it's your task to catch up, right? Because we've learned all the other theory. We've learned all the other places and we are choosing that this is the moment and this is the way to write about this to have the most impact. And so I think we're challenging and I, I hope that folks are challenged and feel challenged if they read texts like these to say, well, I'm not familiar with, you know, this, this black feminist theory, or I'm not familiar with these particular people that you're centralizing as important technological figures. Well, good. Go, go read about it, go mm -hmm. learn about it, and then come back to this text with a new lens and a new mechanism to actually understand more expansively what we're doing here. For sure. No, for sure. And that actually, I think that kind of will go into some of the next questions I have, but I'm going to go to the Q&A because Shana actually asked a question that was one of my own. <laughs> so I'm like, you know, let me just go there. Um, and she asked, what do you envision for digital black feminism to look like and maybe maybe it'll be different than digital black feminism like something we weren't even able to talk about but you talk right. about previously like hip-hop venom is hip-hop exactly. like politics culture technological moves can kind of change the tools that we're focusing around That's and right. that impacts our feminism but right. in general what do you think it could look yeah. like in 150 yeah. years no, that's a great question. I mean, so so did digital black feminism exist 150 years ago? No, it didn't, right? Like black feminism has always existed. <laughs> but the things that are are 
making changes to necessary updates to modifications to challenges to our black feminism shift over time right and so I do talk in the book quite a bit about and I'm very indebted to the work of hip hop feminists for writing about how something like hip hop forever changes our relationship to black feminist thought. How Joan Morgan's When Chicken Heads Come Home to Roost is so central to us thinking about the shades of gray, you know, and this, this, this theory and this, this approach to thinking about black feminist thought that, um, that there are these gray moments and that hip hop feminists become very comfortable in the shades of gray, of thinking that I can love hip hop that sometimes has deeply misogynistic tendencies, right? While being a black feminist. So these are not in conflict for me, that I'm very comfortable in that gray space. Mm. And then I try to take that work and, and mirror that into thinking about what are those gray spaces for digital black feminists? What are the mm. things that we have to adopt, that we have to contend with whilst holding these black feminist principles? So in 150 years, I don't know what it is that black feminists are going to be uh, contending with, uh, loving whilst hating, <laughs> you know, promoting while it does harm. I don't, I'm not certain what those things are, but what I what I can see is the expert ways that we have navigated that in the past, and I can have a very strong confidence in black feminism as the tool to continue to dismantle these systems because it has always been. So when I look back to what black women were doing in the late 1800s to what Anna Julia Cooper was doing with respectability politics to what you know Ida B. Wells was doing with her writing on lynching. When I look at the tools and I look at what has shifted, what our access to tools has shifted for us, what has remained consistent in a lot of cases is our praxis. What's remained consistent is our relationship to these tools, our complicated relationship to these tools as things that we utilize whilst recognizing the harm that we cause of having the ability to navigate those things. So I can't say what 150 years will look like uh, if, if our planet is still, is still functional in 150 years, but I can be very confident that black women have the toolkit to navigate that and that black feminism gives us perhaps our best toolkit toward dismantling uh, you know, these systems of oppression that are interlocking in our lives. Yes. And it seems like in your book, you talk about, you know, like maybe black women in the 1800s, like having to strain their hair to as a political tool to like prove their femininity due to like the right. way it was defined. You know, now I don't have to do that. It almost seems also like kind of what future black feminists do is free us from things that we had to do in the past. And they're right. like, no, we don't have to. That's right. I mean, you see that, I think, in, in spaces like like TikTok and Instagram. What I've really been interested in writing about lately is black feminist pleasure. Um, you know, Mor Morgan has a great uh, piece on, on Black feminist pleasure that I pull from to talk about this, but I'm really fascinated in the way the TikTok content creators are really focused on themselves, right? Like that there's the, the we think of TikTok as being this highly performative place where I'm like doing things for other people to see and to witness and to, but the focus on self-pleasure is one that I think that uh, emerges from digital black feminism, but is really kind of blossoming in an interesting way online right now that I'm looking forward to tracing over the next, you know, five or 10 years. For sure. No, I am too. I've, I'm on TikTok a lot and I've noticed that <laughs> trend. It's, pretty, it's yeah. interesting and, and empowering, honestly. And yeah. I want to take this one last question real quick about third world feminism. Um, they said, thank you. Often looking at Black feminism to crack the third world feminism open. What ways do you feel there's a space for solidarity and that we can point to Black feminism for third world feminism, especially when there's colorism and internalized anti-Blackness? Yeah, thanks for that question. I mean, so I, I begin the book by being really specific because I think it's important to name the things that we're doing that I wrote about in this book, um, Black Americans, right? And because I think that there's a really specific um, history that points to specific things that are happening. But what I also say in the intro is that I really hope that folks take kind of the, the infrastructure of the book, so to speak, right, and find applicable ways to see the overlap in Black diaspora culture across the globe. Because there, there's obviously that, right? I've, I've talked to scholars in Brazil, I've talked to scholars in the UK who have said, ah, some of these principles are really lining up with things I see happening here. I'm like, that's great. I want to be clear that that's not what I was doing. I'm not suggesting that there is this kind of, you know, expansive, everybody everywhere is behaving in similar ways. But I think that our mechanism for studying it 
can be similar whilst acknowledging the very specific historical context. So the relationship to colonialism is different in other places than it is in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. to, the, the, to chattel slavery is different. It's related, but different. So I think that we can point to tenets of Black feminism as being productive and useful for folks to pick up across the globe whilst acknowledging that the local indigenous spaces there are best equipped to figure out how to break down the systems that are specific to those places. So obviously things like anti-Blackness uh, exist globally, that colorism exists globally. So there are things that Black women in these United States have been doing that folks can pick up on. But likewise, there's things that we here need to pay attention to what's going on in other places to understand the overlaps and what the possibilities are for dismantling those systems here. Absolutely. And I love that point, especially like I'm getting an American. It's very interesting thinking of, you know, in Ghana, what's mm -hmm. going on? How would the supply, et cetera? So I really love that point about it being applicable to other spaces. Right. Um, well, thank you so much. I know it's one o'clock that people have to go, but it's been such a like riveting and fun conversation. Catherine, if you have any like last closing remarks, please free, feel free to give give them. I appreciate everyone who put Q and A's in the chat and also commenting. Feel free to tweet at us, and yeah, I'll let you. I'll let you. Oh do no, it. I'll just I just will say thank you so much for this conversation. It's always a pleasure to talk to folks who have read and engaged with the text, and I'm always happy to be in further conversations. So you know. Hit me up on Twitter. Uh, I talk a lot about things like this here, but also about general ratchet Rita has nothing to do with this, but it's a fun space all the same. So I look forward to continuing the conversation with folks uh, ahead. Thank you. Well, it's an honor hosting this, honor a talk with you, Catherine, and I hope that everyone just has a great rest of your day and definitely buy Digital Black Feminism. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.